All right, in this video, I'm going to talk about the biosynthesis of vitamin K. And you can see here I have the shikimate pathway once again on here, and that is because vitamin K will once again be using chorismate as a precursor, uh, which means that it gets, uh, it gets all of its, well, not all of it, but it gets a lot of its uh, atoms, a lot of its material from the uh, from the phosphoenolpyruvate or PEP, and uh, the D erythrose four phosphate, uh, the E four P, which both are made from sugars, uh, and so we can once again see how uh, a, a sort of common molecule, uh, carbohydrates, uh, can become uh, many other different things, and so. Uh, I'm not going to go through the core, or the shikimate pathway again. I went through that in painstaking detail in the last video on vitamin E, uh, but just to remind you that this is using the shikimate pathway, and so we will start from chorismate. Uh, but the first thing I wanted to sort of mention is, uh, so vitamin K is produced by bacteria, uh, and that's one of the main places that we get vitamin K is uh, from our microbiome, which are the bacteria that live in our, our gut. Uh, and so bacteria actually use vitamin K for something different. Uh, so, uh, so vitamin K, so humans actually use vitamin K for uh, things like, like blood clotting. And in future videos, well, I'll actually get into the uh, biochemical process of blood clotting and how vitamin K is actually used in that. But uh, the microbiome or other bacteria as well uh, actually use vitamin K uh, as a way of producing energy, and they do that. Um, they do that in anaerobic. Anaerobic conditions and so you can imagine uh, our our intestines are anaerobic there's little or no oxygen in there because uh, why would there need to be uh, so it's an anaerobic environment and so a lot of the bacteria in our microbiome actually use uh, vitamin K for this anaerobic process and uh, I actually have a diagram up here which I'm not going to go through in any kind of detail uh, but we can see this MKH2 and MK, uh, that's menaquinone. Uh, uh, and so that, that's, uh, I mean, that's just vit that's vitamin K. Uh, and so this is doing a redox reaction. And so uh, these electrons uh, are moving down a, a, an energy gradient uh, through these proteins and using vitamin K here in the bacterial uh, cell membrane and that energy is used to uh, to move hydrogen ions so uh, acid basically uh, from one side of the membrane to the other and so that we have uh, a, a gradient of hydrogen ions so there's a, a high H plus concentration on this side and low H plus on this side. Uh, and then these hydrogen ions, which are being pumped through these proteins here, which are using the energy of the electron uh, that's being donated by uh, NADPH here, uh, or NADH rather. Uh, and so those, those electrons are sort of uh, moved between these various proteins and they are moving down energy gradients as they do, and the energy being released is used to pump these uh, these hydrogen ions to this side of the membrane, uh, such that this uh, protein complex here uh, can uh, the hydrogen ions actually move through it, and moving down that gradient actually uh, is actually energetic, such that this protein complex here can take ATP and phosphate and turn it into ATP, which is the energy molecule. And there's a similar process to this in humans called oxidative phosphorylation, which 
um, I will get into in in painstaking detail in later videos. Uh, but once again, I'm going through this just to say uh, bacteria use vitamin K for something very different than humans do. Humans have sort of repurposed vitamin K for uh, for this uh, blood clotting uh, mechanism here. All right, and so if we start with our chorismate, we go down here to the the uh, biochemical pathway that takes chorismate uh, all the way down here to the vitamin K, the philoquinone and menaquinone here. Uh, and I'll go through these steps in a little more detail, but just to give a broad overview here, we start with the chorismate. Uh, and then what we actually do is we move, uh, we move this, uh, this hydroxyl here to a different carbon. So this is a little bit confusing because uh, because it looks like we're actually moving um, this this right here to a different carbon uh, when in fact um, it is actually this hydroxyl here uh, that is being moved to uh, to this carbon right here and so this is just kind of flipping the molecule sort of around that way uh, and that can be a little confusing and that generates isochorismate. Uh, it's isochorismate because it has all of the same atoms. They are just in a, a different uh, position on in the molecule. Uh, and then this MEND uh, enzyme here takes uh, 2-oxoglutarate, uh, which is an intermediate, um, an intermediate in in uh, in. Uh, and uh, carbohydrate. Wow, I couldn't get that word out. Carbohydrate, carbohydrate metabolism. And so that uh, is produced. Uh, this 2-oxoglutarate, uh, sometimes called 2-ketoglutarate, uh, alpha-ketoglutarate. Uh, so it has a bunch of different names. Uh, so that is added onto uh, onto this this carbon right here. You can see that that is is added right here and we are losing this double bond on here um, and then this MENH is actually removing the pyruvate on here which is uh, this moiety right here and so that is being removed from it uh, then the the MENC is actually removing this hydroxyl group here uh, from this carbon and uh, generating the aromaticity of this uh, six-member ring here. Uh, then the MEN-E, we can see, is uh, just adding this um, this uh, CoA here, which is uh, it's coenzyme A, and we'll uh, look at this structure there. And uh, They've always, well, not always, but often put an S there because it's actually bonding using uh, a sulfur atom in this uh, coenzyme A molecule. Uh, and then MEN-B is actually forming this ring. So it's actually uh, from from this. And so we have then uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six carbons in this ring. Um, and so that is generating the, the uh, six member ring here. Uh, then there's this uh, DHNA CoA thioesterase, which is just removing this uh, this coenzyme A. And then we move down here um, to MEN A, which is taking these uh, polyprenyl pyrophosphates, which are are things like what we saw in previous videos, like the uh, like the farnesyl and the uh, the garanil uh, garanil. So if you remember from previous videos, the farnesyl uh, pyrophosphate, the garanil garanil pyrophosphate. We talked quite a bit about that in previous videos, and so those are uh, being added on right here. Uh, and you can see that we get these large hydrophobic chains added onto here. 
Uh, we have another methyl transferase here with this MENG. Um, we talked about methyl transferases in the previous video on vitamin E using this S adenosylmethionine, uh, which uh, changes it into S adenosyl homocysteine. Um, and that is how our, our, our vitamin K1 and vitamin K2 are produced. Um, all right, so let's go through these steps a little bit more. Uh, so the first one is this MENF protein or enzyme. And uh, that is also called isochorismate synthase because it is turning chorismate into isochorismate. Uh, so we can see over here the mechanism. Uh, as I said in the image before, it kind of looked like this uh, carboxyl group was being moved. But it's actually this hydroxyl group is uh, being taken off of here. And this uh, water is being added on as a hydroxyl group, uh, specifically in this uh, particular stereochemistry here. Um, and so we can see over here uh, a little bit more detail on this mechanism. Um, and so we have a uh, we have this lysine down here, which is actually deprotonating this water. Uh, and so it attacks this uh, this carbon here from the bottom, uh, and this this uh, so this hydroxyl group here is being removed, and we can see here uh, we have our uh, our pyruvate right there, and we have our our carboxyl group there, which is being held there by this magnesium ion, uh, and so. One thing I also wanted to point out, which uh, we can actually see over here, uh, this isochorismate um, is also produced by other proteins, uh, and in particular, one called ENTC. Uh, and so these two enzymes actually do the same reaction, uh, the same uh, chorismate to isochorismate reaction. They are just uh, they're just regulated differently from one from one another, uh, and so in the the presence of of iron in the oxidized form, uh, in its most oxidized form, which is three plus as opposed to iron uh, iron two plus, uh, so in an oxid oxid oxidizing environment, uh, you are going to have men F down regulated. Because as we said, that happen this uh, is needed in an anaerobic environment. So if we're in an oxygen rich environment, an aerobic environment, then we don't need men F, but this ENTC uh, needs to generate um, isochorismate. So that through a few steps uh, in the addition of serine, uh, we create, uh, well, not we, bacteria actually uh, generate these. Uh, these uh, molecules that look like this, um, they, they're called uh, siderophores, and they uh, bind to iron in the 3 plus oxidative, oxidation state. And this is actually how bacteria uh, steal, steal uh, iron from us, uh, iron being um, a mineral that humans need. Uh, so humans have actually evolved uh, their own proteins that can actually bind to this uh, enterobactin here, uh, which is what this particular siderophore is called. Uh, and so there's sort of a competition going on between the bacteria trying to grab onto this and our own uh, our own immune system trying to grab onto this in order to keep our own iron and um, I had originally thought about going through this in more detail, but it's kind of uh, uh, it, it's kind of sidetracking. So I think that's the uh, extent of the detail I'm going to get into with that. Uh, so I do have over here uh, the various steps. So uh, we have the ENT, the ENT-C uh, generating the isochorismate, and then uh, we can move down through here and uh, generate our uh, enterobactin. Uh, but anyway, 
Uh, let's take a look at the actual structure of this isochorismate synthase, which I have right here. And so you can see the, uh, you can see the, uh, so this is actually the isochorismate here. So this in yellow here is the product uh, still in the active site here. And this uh, gray sphere here is the magnesium, which you can see is where this uh, carboxylate here is binding. Uh, I have in purple down here the lysine, which, uh, which we saw was uh, this particular lysine right here. And so we can see how that is uh, is below this this product here, and we can see that this hydroxyl group right here is actually in this particular uh, this particular stereochemistry here, where this is pointing down. Uh, that's pointing down, and this um, this pyruvate here is pointing up, and so we can see that in um, in this right here, so we can see that our, our hydroxyl here is uh, pointing sort of into the screen and our pyruvate is pointing out of the screen. And so we can see with this how that uh, how that is achieved here in the active site with this lysine down at the bottom. Uh, so this, this uh, aspartate here is sort of uh, coordinating with the magnesium ion. And yeah, we can see how this uh, how this active site is able to catalyze this particular reaction. All right, and so the next step in our process here is the MEND, which <coughs> which I have down here, uh, and so the MEND. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to go through it this with this one. So MEND is actually using uh, thiamine, vitamin B1, and we will go through the biosynthesis of vitamin B1 in a future video. But uh, just to uh, just to point out the structure of it here, uh, so it's actually uh, thiamine pyrophosphate that's being used, and that's this structure here. Uh, this up here is just the thiamine without the pyrophosphate on this. Uh, this hydroxyl group. And so this breaks it down into the various uh, components of the thiamine pyrophosphate. It has this uh, amino pyridinium ring and this thiazolium ring. And so it's actually this thiazolium ring that is, is being used as uh, what's called a cofactor in this reaction. That is, uh, that is something that the B vitamins uh, are used for uh, well, that's like the main thing they're used for is as a cofactor. So they're something that binds into the enzyme and uh, actually aid or are actually required for the catalysis of that enzyme's particular reaction. And so uh, these cofactors, things like the B vitamins, are used in multiple different enzymes. So this is just a single enzyme where... Uh, this vitamin B1, this thiamine, is uh, being used as a cofactor. Uh, and we can see here that um, the mechanism, so this right here is the thiazolium ring from the, vi the vitamin B. Uh, you can see it has the sulfur and this methyl group and the nitrogen. This has a sulfur, and, uh, and this uh, would be going to the, the pyrophosphate. This is the methyl group here, and this is our nitrogen. Uh, and so we can see that this is, uh, this is actually uh, binding to this, which is the uh, two keto glutarate or, or uh, two oxoglutarate. Uh, and so you are actually forming a, a bond between the thiazolium ring uh, and the, um, and the two oxoglutarate. So we have this uh, bond forming right here uh, between these two uh, molecules. Um, and then what happens is the uh, electrons on this oxygen here, which is this oxygen here, collapse down. Uh, this bond here breaks and creates a double bond here. And so we are losing this uh, carboxylate here as CO2. Uh, 
Uh, and now we have this double bond here, which as we saw here, this, um, this double bond had its electrons go onto the nitrogen. So now we have these electrons here, which can collapse back down, uh, breaks the double bond here. And the electrons end up forming a carboanion right here, a negative charge on that carbon. And it's the negative charge, the, uh, the lone pair uh, on that carbon there, which is going to attack uh, this carbon here on, on this, on the uh, isochorismate. And so this double bond um, actually, uh, the electrons from this double bond actually go and grab onto a, a hydrogen here. Uh, and so what we see end up happening here is now we have this hydrogen, which uh, was this hydrogen and this carboxylate here. Uh, but now uh, this hydroxyl group on here from the two oxoglutarate, which is this one, so it's actually going to go down and uh, and form a double bond here, which is going to cause this bond here to uh, to break off of the thiazolium ring, and so we're actually breaking uh, this bond right here off of the thiazolium ring, and that generates this uh, SEPHCHC intermediate. Uh, and this shows this next step uh, sort of happening right afterwards. And uh, actually, it was thought for a while that uh, MEND was actually doing this step here. Uh, it's uh, slightly more recently that this other enzyme, MEND-H, was discovered to actually take it from this form uh, over to the SHCHC form. Uh, and so we can look at the, the structure of this. Uh, so this, uh, this is the, um, the enzyme here. And uh, I have the different uh, domains on it uh, sort of colored differently. And the domains, so the first domain, which is in this sort of, um, uh, I guess, ruby or almost purple color is the it binds the amino pyridinium ring of the thiamine pyrophosphate. And so we can actually see that thiamine pyrophosphate down in here, uh, this one in yellow that has the two, the two rings on it. So we can see this is that, uh, that amino uh, pyridinium ring. And so we can see that that is uh, being bound to uh, or it's associating here with this uh, sort of more purplish area here. Uh, and then there is a second domain, which is uh, this low con conservation domain down here. Uh, I guess this is more of a ruby color here, isn't it? Uh, and this is actually a, a very non-conserved domain. So in this enzyme across different species of bacteria, this domain is less conserved. And you can kind of see why, uh, why that would be the case, because it's not really involved in the active site uh, up here. Uh, and so there is also the third domain, uh, which I have right here. Uh, and I think this might have been on the, the uh, other subunit. Uh, but we can see, um, we can see that same yeah, this green region here is actually uh, the one for the subunit we are interested in. And that's, uh, that's the part that's binding the pyrophosphate on the thiamine pyrophosphate over here. So we can see the, the pyrophosphate, these two uh, phosphate moieties here in this magnesium ion in gray that, as I've talked about before, that's very common for pyrophosphate or phosphates of uh, of all kinds and enzymes to be stabilized by this magnesium here. Uh, and then we can see um, right here, this is our, uh, this right here is our substrate. And we can see that that is adjacent here to this uh, thiazolium ring on our vitamin B1. And so we can see how this could form that, uh, that intermediate that's bound to it. Um, and uh, the nitrogen here, the sulfur here, and so we can see 
how this enzyme brings those two things into close proximity to each other uh, such that the, the uh, reaction can take place. All right, so the next one we have here is, uh, is uh, the MEN-H, which as I said is the one that uh, was once thought to, uh, the reaction that it performs was once thought to be done by the MEN-D, but it's now known that this MEN-H is actually doing it. Um, and so we can see here, uh, this enzyme actually uses what's known as the, the catalytic triad. Uh, catalytic triad, and it's uh, it's it's one that's it's a mechanism that's used in in other enzymes as well. Uh, so probably maybe ones you've heard of would be things like like trypsin and chymotrypsin, uh, which we will get into in future videos. Uh, but these are uh, these are enzymes in the stomach that actually break down proteins. Uh, but here we are, um, we are performing this reaction instead. And so the catalytic triad, uh, so I think I have that down here. Uh, yeah, so this is what's known as the catalytic triad, is this uh, serine histidine aspartate triad here. So the serine uh, is deprotonated by the histidine, which is held in place and stabilized by this aspartate. Uh, up here they show just the histidine and the serine, uh, but there would be uh, an aspartate over here uh, with a negative charge that would be uh, forming a, a hydrogen bond with that. And so that sort of holds the histidine in place. So this deprotonates the serine, uh, which then uh, extracts this hydrogen, which we know is going to be more acidic. It's going to have a, a lower pKa because it's adjacent. To, it's on a carbon adjacent to this carbon double bound, bound oxygen, uh, which we know is, um, is stabilized by resonance, uh, which you can actually see down here. So this would actually be the the resonance structure here, uh, but then these the electrons on the car on the oxygen uh, go back down to reform the double bond. These this double bond is moved uh, to here, this double bond to here, uh, and then this uh, this pyruvate here is removed. Uh, so we have the uh, pyruvate removed, and now we just have this SHCHC. Um, and so over here, I have a multiple sequence alignment that's just showing some of the uh, some of the conserved residues between um, between different organisms. Uh, so this would be E. coli. Uh, I don't remember exactly which ones these were, but they they would be other bacteria, probably things like uh, Staphylococcus or Streptococcus or things like that. Uh, and we can see these um, these regions here that have these conserved uh, residues, and they are uh, specifically pointing out these conserved uh, tyrosine and arginine here, uh, and arginine and uh, and aspartate here, uh, and so those are conserved residues there, uh, and so we can actually look at the structure of it here. So this is the MEN-H. Um, and so we can see in here, so this is our, uh, this right here is our product. We can see that it has the uh, pyruvate removed from it. Um, and so we can actually see uh, with these, uh, with these uh, residues here, uh, so down here is our our histidine right here. So this is the histidine. This is the aspartate that we can see is is right next to this uh, this nitrogen with a hydrogen on it here, uh, and so that's stabilizing it there. And then this right here is right next to this serine here, which is the the serine that this histidine will deprotonate, uh, and then this 
uh, the steering here can actually extract that hydrogen off as we uh, saw right here off of this hydrogen uh, next to the uh, the two oxo glutarate which is what we can see right here this uh, two oxo glutarate moiety uh, right here and this serine is right next to that carbon right here where the two oxo glutarate is is bound to it uh, and so this um, this enzyme also has something that's uh, that's somewhat common, which is called an uh, ox anion hole, uh, and so that is is actually from the backbone nitrogens of of these residues here. So this phenylalanine here and uh, and this leucine here. So we could actually see the um, the nitrogen here, which has this uh, hydrogen on it, is uh, hydrogen bonding to this uh, oxygen, this double bound oxygen here. Uh, and we have the same thing, if I can find it, uh, going on with this leucine here. Yeah, so up here is that nitrogen with a hydrogen, uh, which is uh, hydrogen bonding with this oxygen right here that it's double bound to. Um, and we can also see in this that we have, uh, so these are those arginines, these arginines here in, in the gray with the, the blue nitrogens. So those are those conserved arginines there. And we can see these uh, seem to be stabilizing this charged, uh, this charged uh, carboxylate group here. And now we also have things like this uh, like this uh, right here, which is uh, the tryptophan, which is a tryptophan. Uh, we have uh, we have this uh, tyrosine right here. So that that tryptophan and tyrosine are things like uh, like this this tyrosine here, the Y. That's the single letter code for tyrosine. And that tryptophan would be this W here. That's the single letter code for for uh, tryptophan, and so we can see that those uh, those large hydrophobic residues are creating sort of the shape of the active site here, um, and so that is generating the shape of the active site, which makes it specific for this uh, this molecule. So this this right here in yellow is actually the product, uh, but it would also be uh, it would also be accommodate the substrate, the reactant as well. And you can see up here in this sort of cap domain, I have, uh, I have uh, a structural alignment here. Um, uh, so the green is part of this, this, uh, this full protein here. And then the blue is, I believe, in the, the sort of open conformation. And so you can imagine that this enzyme uh, I'll make a little quick diagram over here uh, so you can imagine it as being sort of uh, open like this when there is no substrate bound uh, and then when the substrate comes in uh, this sort of uh, closes in around the the substrate and uh, that is what that cap domain is doing there and so that is the MEN-H mechanism there. Uh, and so the next one here is the MEN-C, uh, which we can see is removing this hydroxyl group. Um, so I have that uh, over here. And so we can see with this, our SHCHC is, is coming into the enzyme. This carboxylate, once again, uh, is being... Uh, stabilized by a magnesium, uh, a magnesium ion. We have this uh, lysine here. K is the one-letter code for lysine, and this listed as 133. I added this 163 here. Uh, 133 is probably for a different species, uh, but the structure that I have, uh, this is actually lysine 163. We can see this is acting as a base. It's removing this hydrogen here, which uh, this should actually be a carbon right here. This should be a carbon. 
uh, that's a mistake in this uh, this figure that I that I stole from Google Images, uh, and so this hydrogen is being extracted, which we can see uh, is resonance stabilized by this uh, carbon, this adjacent carbon double bound to an oxygen. <laughs> And so after we've extracted that hydrogen, uh, once again, this should be a carbon right there. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, created a double bond uh, with this carbon here. And so now we have it like this. We, we have the, the, this carbon double bound to this carbon right here. But now these electrons on this oxygen are going to collapse back down reforming this double bond here, which, uh, which uh, we had right there. Uh, this, this double bond, then the electrons for that have to go somewhere. It's going to uh, collapse back down here um, and, and remove this hydroxyl group. It's gonna kind of sort of push this uh, OH off, which is probably then going to uh, grab uh, a hydrogen from from somewhere else. Well, this shows it grabbing the hydrogen back off of the the uh, the lysine there. And this uh, this is another mistake here. This should be a double bond because we are generating the aromaticity of this uh, the six member ring here. Uh, and so uh, maybe I should have taken a better look at this figure before I decided to use it. Um, and so we can see down here. Uh, these aromatic rings, but this is actually, uh, and so this is an interesting thing about this uh, this men C enzyme, is that uh, it it actually catalyzes other different reactions, uh, and so it has what they call an uh, N acyl amino uh, well acid acid racemase, uh, which uh, is also for short N triple A acyl amino acid racemase activity. Uh, and so this enzyme can also uh, perform this reaction. So this is a racemization here of N succinyl D phenylalanine and N succinyl L phenylalanine. So if you remember uh, from an earlier video, uh, particularly the one about amino acids, I said that uh, in biological life on Earth, almost all amino acids are in the L form. There are a few notable exceptions for bacteria where they use some D amino acids very, very, very sparingly. Uh, but otherwise, L amino acids are, are the kind that, that are, are used in biological life on Earth. And so what this does, uh, this uh, N acyl amino acid racemase does, is allow bacteria to actually uh, consume D amino acids, which uh, would otherwise just be uh, inert or uh, who knows, maybe even uh, poisonous. And it can then, if you uh, put the, the bacteria into media that had just D amino acids, uh, it could then turn them into L amino acids. Um, and so that's what I have over here. So you can, we can see that uh, this D phenylalanine uh, is, then has this succinyl group added onto it. Uh, then this, uh, this amino acid, this is uh, uh, NSAR, so N succinyl amino acid racemase, turns this D -phenyl succinyl phenylalanine into L, uh, and then the succinate can be removed. Uh, and now we, well, not we, but the bacteria have produced the usable L phenylalanine form. Uh, and so I actually have some kinetics data here. Uh, so down here um, is the N, uh, N acylated, N acetyl, uh, N acetyl R, and so that's just the uh, the particular stereochemistry. So if you remember from 
a previous video I talked about chirality uh, can either be uh, R or S chirality and that's just the, the sort of mirror images of each other uh, and so this is looking at the um, the turnover rate and the binding affinity for uh, N uh, N acetyl R methionine N acetyl S methionine uh, so the two different um, uh, the two different stereochemistries. So in this case, since uh, since there is only a single uh, chiral chiral carbon, uh, R is uh, R and S are equivalent to the L and D forms. Uh, so and then it also has a N succinyl R methionine and N succinyl S methionine. Uh, then N, S, uh, R, P, G, and S, P, G, um, I forget what the P, G is, um, but anyway, then this down here is, uh, the substrate for our, the reaction that we're interested in here for the production of vitamin K, but we can see that, um, that the turnover rates for these, uh, these n succinyl amino acids uh, so the turnover rates are are very similar to that for our um, f for our vitamin K pathway uh, and we can see that the binding affinity uh, so the binding affinity isn't quite as good it's on the order of 10 to the negative 3 uh, where the uh, SHCHC is 10 to the negative 4 so it's about one order of magnitude better binding, tighter binding uh, for the SHCHC. Uh, and then up here is uh, kinetics for the N succinylated versions of all of the, um, the L amino acids. And we can see here that, uh, that particularly these ones uh, up here, uh, they have these uh, fairly decent uh, turnover rates. Uh, the uh, Km is uh, in millimolar uh, and so th these are actually not that amazing. Uh, so a lot of times you want your uh, your Km to be in the, uh, this, this is supposed to be a new uh, for micro, so micro molar range. Uh, so I mean it's decent it's not like it's not binding uh, these ones down here uh, do not seem to have um, do not seem to have much for activity down here and so uh, uh, maybe they don't catalyze these ones as much but these amino acids up here it can actually uh, catalyze um, this reaction here uh, pretty decently and so that's just kind of an interesting fact about this this uh, enzyme is that it's what is called in biochemistry uh, promiscuous which uh, it's kind of the when when we say the same thing about people in life that they they uh, they are not very discerning about who they uh, who they have sex with and these this enzyme here is not very discerning about who about what molecule it actually catalyzes uh, and we can actually see here for the men see um, the structure uh, and so I have here uh, I have here in the cyan this is the the uh, the substrate for our vitamin K reaction and we can see here if we look back at this that lysine 163 is this one that I have in gray uh, and so we can see that that is close over here to this particular carbon on the substrate which uh, is where it's deprotonating we can see our magnesium here uh, stabilizing this carboxylate um, and we can see I have in green uh, the other amino acids that are sort of making contacts with the substrate. Uh, but then we can also um, we can also take a look here at the uh, at the N 
N-acetylated methionine. Uh, and so we can, uh, let's get that in sticks. So this is the N-acetylated methionine. Uh, we can see here the methionine side chain with the sulfur. Uh, we go down here and our nitrogen has this acetyl group on it. That's why it's called N-acetylated. We can see that that fits into the active site very similarly to the um, to the the SHCHC. We can see that our lysine here is is close to this carbon here, which is our chiral carbon, uh, and so that will be stabilized. So what could happen is this deprotonates this carbon, uh, then it would cause this this carbon to become a, a, a planar, so it would become planar. And so what we see is our, our chiral carbon is something like this, uh, so R1, uh, R2, R3, and we'll say that this over here is our H, and so if this H is extracted, uh, then this actually becomes something like like this and so now instead of this coming in uh, out of the screen uh, it's this nice planar uh, this nice planar like this and in fact it would uh, it would have a double bond to one of these this would be uh, an sp2 uh, an sp2 carbon here and then uh, we can actually uh, have another hydrogen uh, and that would probably be the one that the lysine took, would actually come in from the top, from the other direction. And so then we would end up with, uh, with this, R1, R2, and now uh, the hydrogen is actually coming out of the screen and the R3 is actually going into the screen. And so we can see how this same mechanism that we are are using for this can actually be used to uh, to change the the uh, stereochemistry, change the chirality of that uh, chiral carbon there. Uh, and I'll model this back in so we can overlap it, uh, and we can see here that those carbons where the hydrogens being extracted uh, end up in the same position inside the active site here. Uh, and so that is the um, the men C enzyme. And so the next one, if we go back over here, is our men E enzyme. Uh, and so this one is the one that's just adding this uh, this coenzyme A. And so I don't have much here for that because it's a it's a pretty straightforward reaction. Uh, so the coenzyme A. Uh, actually, I have the model for that down here in the next for the next enzyme. So this is the this is what coenzyme A looks like just uh, on its own. Uh, so A because it has this uh, this adenine here, um, and then it has the these phosphates on here. Then it has this sort of long chain here. But this sulfur is kind of the the one we are interested in for this. So that sulfur uh, is deprotonated. Um, it then, uh, well, actually, in this mechanism, to drive the reaction, we are actually attaching. So when ATP comes in, uh, it binds on this first phosphate in the ATP, and therefore releases pyrophosphate. So that's a a very um, a very favorable reaction. Uh, and then also favorable is this uh, coenzyme A with its sulfur here uh, coming in. And so uh, that would be the sulfur here. And then uh, we'll just say this is the coenzyme A. And so this hydrogen will be extracted from it. Uh, the electrons from the bond here will go to attack this uh, this. Uh, carbonyl carbon here, which then kicks off the AMP there, and now we have our our coenzyme A bound to our um, our OSB, our O-succinyl benzoyl CoA. 
well, it becomes O-succinyl benzoyl CoA. It was just O-succinyl benzoate here. Uh, and so we can see in the <clears throat> the men E on this. Um, so we can actually see uh, down here. Uh, this is the AMP here. So this is the AMP that was uh, kicked off of our our OSB, which is uh, this up here. And we can see this is bound onto this long molecule here, which is the uh, which is the coenzyme A. And I believe this is just a coenzyme A analog uh, that they used for this structure. It has the same sort of uh, structure as as this this one here, but um, but it does not have that sulfur there. Uh, and so we can see um, we can see our 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 product here bound to the coenzyme A. Uh, and so I can actually here model in uh, where was that? Um, should be this one, I think. No, uh, I'm pretty sure I have. Yeah, there we are. Uh, and so this one I can remove. And so you can actually see here. So, uh, so this is the uh, in yellow sort of overlapped with this uh, with the product here the O succinyl benzo benzoyl CoA the OSB CoA uh, the yellow here overlapped with with the OSB moiety is uh, the reactant which is the OSB um, and uh, yeah I think that was yeah so I'll try putting Okay, all right, so that's that's what I had. But we can see over here, uh, so this is the um, the carboxylate here that is going to be binding uh, to the AMP. So we can see how that's very close to this AMP. Uh, but then the sulfur from the uh, coenzyme A would come in and attack this carbon right here, and that kicks the um, the AMP back off of it. And once again, we can see here we have a, a magnesium ion stabilizing the uh, the phosphate there. Uh, we have a magnesium over here stabilizing this uh, pyrophosphate. Uh, these purple ones are sodiums. I do not know if those are actually found in the uh, in the enzyme in its natural state, or if those are just there because of how they the conditions they had to crystallize this in, uh, but we can see that these um, these magnesiums here are 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 as usual stabilizing the pyrophosphate. All right, and so the next step, uh, as we saw, is um, our men B, which is uh, doing this cyclization here, and we can go down here so. Uh, the men B, as I said, is is cyclizing this. Um, uh, interestingly, and so this is something else I found. Um, if you do not have this men B enzyme, if you just produce this with the men C and then just kind of let it sit there, it will actually form this molecule here spontaneously, uh, and so without any enzyme. Uh, it, it will form this uh, sort of weird looking molecule here. And so we need this men B in order to produce um, to produce this DHNA CoA that we need uh, <clears throat> for um, for our further uh, vitamin K biosynthesis. So over here I have the uh, the reaction. And so it starts uh, so we have our, our oxygen here being stabilized by the backbone nitrogens on this glycine. Uh, this shows that this carboxylate is actually deprotonating uh, this carbon here, which once again we know is more acidic because this carbon is adjacent to a carbon double bound to uh, to oxygen. So it's going to be resonance 
there's going to be that resonance structure. So this uh, this carbon here is deprotonated. So we end up with this double bond here in this uh, this oxo anion, this negatively charged oxygen. So the electrons on this are actually going to collapse back down and the electrons in this double bond are going to go onto this carbon to form this carbo anion which uh, is fairly unstable and so that's going to quickly attack this uh, this carbonyl carbon here on this carboxylate uh, and form uh, form the bond between those carbons um, and then the the Electrons in this oxygen will collapse back down. It will kick this uh, hydroxyl off, which will then uh, cr grab the hydrogen that was extracted, uh, possibly, well, I guess not in this step. This already has that hydrogen on there, but it's, it's going to grab a hydrogen from somewhere. <laughs> uh, if, if we can, we could probably figure out if we wanted to do all of our bookkeeping, but uh, I'm just going to move on here. And so that will come off as a, a water here. Uh, and so, uh, so this actually shows this next step where we have the, um, the, uh, where we have the reduction of the oxygens here, but uh, that's not really a, a necessary step in this. Uh, as we can see um, over here, uh, this just shows us actually continuing to use the the uh, oxidized form of those of those carbons there. Uh, and down here, I have uh, a little bit of kinetics data, uh, and so we can see uh, when they when they mutate this lysine or this phenylalanine or this arginine or this lysine into in alanine. Uh, and that's a pretty common mutation to do if you want to try and test a loss of function uh, because an alanine um, is an amino acid that uh, is something like like this. Uh, so it has just a single methyl group on it like that. Uh, and so you are not losing the chirality of your alpha carbon, uh, but you were also just removing sort of any other part of the side chain that you would have going on up here. And so alanine is a very common one to mutate it into. Uh, and so we can see that mutating this lysine 91 gives us uh, a complete loss of function, ND being uh, no detection. Um, and we can see here that, uh, that our KCAT, which they have it in uh, in turnovers per minute, which tells us that this is actually kind of a slow reaction. So uh, one turnover, 1.24 turnovers every minute is uh, fairly slow. Uh, but we see that uh, this slows down even more if we get rid of this uh, phenylalanine here or this uh, arginine here. Uh, but we actually see uh, a slight uptick in the turnover rate if we lose this lysine here. Uh, however, we can see that uh, that we are losing some binding affinity if we lose that lysine there. And so uh, there's kind of a trade-off there between binding affinity and turnover rate. And the binding affinity is, is uh, something like uh, an order of magnitude worse, where this is only uh, twice as good. Uh, so orders of magnitude are much larger. And so it's going to sacrifice a little bit of that turnover rate uh, for this uh, higher binding affinity here. Um, and so we can look at our our MEN-B uh, enzyme here. And this, is, uh, this enzyme exists as this uh, complex hexamer here. Uh, and so you can see that these the subunits of this protein, the monomers of this protein, are are sort of intertwining with each other. Uh, and you can actually see here in the active site that the active site is composed of residues from this uh, green uh, subunit, this green monomer, and this um, this purple uh, monomer here, this purple subunit. So it's 
the active site is actually where the two uh, monomers actually meet each other, which is uh, is pretty interesting. That's a little unusual. Um, and so we can see here, uh, this is our, uh, so we can see sort of sticking out here, this is the uh, coenzyme A. Uh, if we move further down into the active site, we can see uh, the sulfur here that's bound then to our, our OSB. Um, well, this is actually uh, with the, the, uh, the ring already formed, so this is product that's bound in here. Um, and we can see the various uh, the various uh, amino acid residues um, poking into the the active site. Uh, so this lysine here, which is uh, which is 95, um, it's probably the equivalent of this 91st uh, lysine here. Uh, this is probably from a different species. So it's it, its numbers are not going to be exactly the same, but this lysine here uh, seems to be pretty important for uh, for binding because when they mutated it into an alanine, uh, they completely lost all function for this enzyme. Um, so this lysine here is uh, 300 and second. I don't know if that is... Uh, no, I don't think that one is represented on here. Um, so what else did we have? Uh, so we had the phenylalanine 270. Uh, so that might be, yeah, it might be that one. Uh, so maybe that phenylalanine right here in, in purple. Uh, so perhaps that is the equivalent in this structure to what they mutated in that in that kinetics experiments. Uh, and so we can just see how uh, the amino acids that uh, stick into the, the active site here are very important for the uh, activity of our, of our enzyme. Um, and so we saw in the mechanism over here, uh, actually it was right over here. So these two glycines here uh, I actually have those pointed out, um, pointed out here in the structure. Where were they? Uh, I saw them just, as, uh, yeah, down here. They're, I have them still in green. Uh, so you can see these glycines, which don't have any side chain, but you can see that uh, their their main chain nitrogens are are sort of close in proximity here with uh, with our 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 product and so those are forming hydrogen bonds with the product with uh, this oxygen here uh, on our our OSB CoA. Uh, this shows uh, an aspartate uh, 192. Uh, I don't know if I can find that on here. This is this is kind of a, a busy active site. Uh, in fact, I think. Uh, maybe if I remove all the cartoon and leave just the active site here, it makes it a little easier to see uh, everything going on down here. Uh, and so that's a phenylalanine 61. Uh, it's probably not that one. But anyway, this is just the active site residues with all of well, these little cross things are water. Uh, but we can see how... Uh, the active site residues uh, are sort of accommodating this uh, this product here in the in the active site. Uh, yeah, I don't think I'm going to dwell on that too much more. Uh, I do have up here uh, this uh, proline, which we can see in this in this sort of tight bend up here. If we uh, put our cartoon back in, uh, we can see that that is. Uh, creating a tight bend in this loop here between alpha helices. Uh, anyway, I think I've rambled on about this one uh, quite enough. Uh, and so that was our uh, men B. Uh, now if we go to men A, which um, I couldn't find a structure for on PDB and protein data bank, 
but we did see this mechanism uh, in a previous video. So that's just adding our our uh, our garinal garinal pyrophosphates. So G G P P and uh, garinal pyrophosphate and farnesyl pyrophosphate. Uh, basically, these these uh, molecules here, and that's just adding those onto our our uh, double ring structure here. Uh, and so we can see that the pyrophosphate is removed from this, which is uh, a, a favorable uh, reaction. Uh, removing phosphates is favorable, and removing pyrophosphates is even more favorable. And that allows us to generate this carbo uh, this carbocation here, which uh, has resonance stabilization with that double bond there. Uh, and then this uh, double bond here uh, sort of attacks the the uh, so the electrons which are negatively charged attacks the the positively charged carbon right here uh, and that adds adds onto this ring here uh, and then the pyrophosphate can be used to extract a hydrogen uh, which as I said uh, this shows this in the uh, in the reduced form but it could also be uh, in the double bound uh, oxidized form uh, and so that would stabilize um, the the uh, the removal of this hydrogen here uh, and then the electrons from that bond collapse down and regenerate the aromaticity of this ring and that is how we add on these long hydrophobic chains to our uh, our ring system there um, and then to finish this off, so that is adding these hydrophobic chains. Uh, then we just have this um, this uh, methyl transferase going on, and uh, that. So I went through methyl transferases in the previous video, so I won't go through it here. But we can see that's just adding a methyl group onto that carbon right there, uh, and that is how we generate our vitamin K. And down here is just uh, an interesting little figure I found, which uh, just shows on the vitamin K the source of all the uh, atoms in it. Uh, and so we know that our long hydrophobic chain is uh, from these prenyl pyrophosphates, which was uh, our garinal pyrophosphate and farnesyl pyrophosphate, those type of uh, molecules. Uh, these these uh, atoms all right here come from the shikimate pathway which was what this had in common with vitamin E. Uh, these carbons right here and this oxygen uh, all came from this uh, two keto glutarate or the alpha uh, keto glutarate uh, or the two uh, to oxoglutarate, so you can use those all interchangeably. Uh, and this uh, this methyl group here, which came from our methyl transferase, came from the uh, S-adenosyl methionine, which was um, which was the same as with our vitamin E. Uh, and so that is how uh, vitamin K is biosynthesized in uh, in bacteria. Um, humans, as I said, do not generate vitamin K on their own. We get it uh, from our microbiome and from our diet. Uh, but because we get it from the microbiome, it's, uh, it's pretty difficult to be deficient in vitamin K. Uh, and so that's not usually one that we have to worry about too much. Uh, so there are certain uh, genetic problems and things like that that can... Uh, that can cause vitamin K deficiency, but your typical average person is just going to get enough from their microbiome and what they get out of their, their diet. Uh, yeah, and so that is the biosynthesis of vitamin K. Uh, in the next video, I will talk about vitamin D, which is um, it's a little bit different than the three we've covered which, uh, as I said, we're using these uh, polyprenyl pyrophosphates. Uh, so K and E both use this shikimate pathway. So 
these three have a, a little bit in common where vitamin D is different uh, and particularly different in so far as uh, humans can actually do it. Uh, but anyway, I'll get into that in the next video. So I will see you then.